welcome to this edition of Africa Speaks. My name is Joy Doreen Dira and today we are going to be discussing two very important issues and one of them is the relocation of the Dab refugee camp to Somalia and also later on we will be uh, talking about the African migrants who continue to die en route to Europe. And we're talking about countries like Italy and especially with the capsizing of the boat that we did see earlier on during the week where over 700 people are said to have died, which is about the worst shipwreck ever uh, that, that has been recorded. We're also going to be looking into why African nationals continue uh, to, you know, take or trek to Italy well knowing all so well that their lives are in danger. So uh, those are the two main issues we're going to be tackling today. And uh, in studio with me is Abdullahi Boru, who is an analyst for the Horn of Africa and also a researcher with Amnesty. Thank you so much, Abdullahi, for joining me. Now, Kenya has given the United Nations three months to remove a camp housing more than, well, half a million or over 300,000 Somali refugees as part of a get tough response to the killing of 147 people by Somali gunmen at a Kenyan university, that was Garissa uh, University College. And uh, according to what we know, the Islamist militants have been accused of hiding out in the Dab camp, which it now wants the UN refugee agency, UNHCR, to move across the border to inside Somalia. The camp was first established in 1991 when civil war broke out in neighboring Somalia and over subsequent years has received waves of refugees fleeing conflict and drought. Now, the United Nations puts the number of registered refugees in the chronically overcrowded settlements of permanent structures, mud shanties, and tents at around 335,000. There are also camp houses, uh, schools, clinics, and community centers in there. In addition to moving the Dadaab camp, Kenya is building a 435 mile or about 700 kilometer wall covering most of the Somali border from Mandera to Kiunga, a wall that uh, the Deputy President William Ruto says has begun to prevent Al-Shabaab elements from getting into Kenya. The Deputy President has also vowed that any business collaborate, uh, collaborations with the militant group would be shut down. And joining me now in studio to discuss this, Abdullahi Boru, like I mentioned earlier, he's an East Africa researcher at Amnesty and Horn of Africa analyst. Thank you so much, Abdullahi, for joining us. Um, first of all, what are your thoughts or what are your views in regard to the relocation of the refugee camp? I think, um, I think we, we, we've got to def divide you know, uh, the consequences of saying we, should, we will close the refugee camps into you know, two issues. One will be the purely the security consequences of that. First, if indeed we, don't, we haven't had any evidence from the government that actually the Dada refugee camp has turned into an incubator for the terrorists, then the question arises, if we move these refugees from inside Kenya into Somalia, and we, were, we are unable to you know, uh, fully track you know, Al-Shabaab's penetration there, how can we guarantee when they are inside Somalia an area that we cannot control? That's number one. Number two, what will happen is that for Al-Shabaab, this will be an incredible uh, bonanza, uh, uh, recruitment bonanza. You know, you have over 300 people who are disen uh, disenchanted, who have been treated badly. They are moving on to the other side, and they will have even very ease of trying to recruit from them, right? Mm -hmm. uh, that is, th th that is uh, one, one, one issue that we need to uh, consider. The other one is the humanitarian and, uh, you know, Kenya's obligation as far as the refugees are concerned. You know, at the very outset, I must insist that Kenya has, um, has carried the disproportionate amount of burden as far as the refugees are concerned. There are some kids who are born in the refugee camps and now adults and they have married and they have kids. So in that, we shouldn't forget. However, Kenya has an international obligation to take care of the refugees who are here now, right? So if we are saying we are pushing them back into Somalia, we are reneging on our particular obligation, either under UN or even the AU Charter as far as the refugees are concerned. Those are some of the things that we have to consider before saying they are moving. 
The third angle to this is the question of the logistics. Mm -hmm. How can we transfer 350, uh, over 350,000 people from Kenya into Somalia within a period of three months? Here we are speaking about children, unaccompanied minors, you know, moving these people and setting up more camps inside Somalia, an area that is not safe. You know, uh, the path from, you know, Dadaab into Somalia is not safe either. So we are essentially speaking of, a, you know, an impending serious humanitarian problem if we do not move very carefully. And the other thing finally is if indeed, you know, these refugees or the camp has been turned into um, an Al-Shabaab bastion, what will happen is that if that is the reason we are pushing them out, which country in the region is going to pick uh, to take these refugees? So for me, I mean, those are some of the issues that we need to consider before we actually say uh, we are moving the refugees into Somalia. Right, and uh, you did mention a humanitarian crisis, but then um, a tripartite agreement was signed in November 2013 uh, between Somalia, Kenya, as well as the UNHCR, and part of it actually did involve the repatriation of some of the Somali uh, citizens back home. But when you look at the time uh, that has been given for the relocation of the refugee camp, do you think that this is even possible? This time frame that has been given by uh, Kenya for the relocation of the refugees do you think it's walkable and and yet still are we also going to see uh, some of the refugees now that they have been accused or they have been linked to uh, al-shabaab uh, militia group do you think that we are going to see more of them retaliating after they've been re relocated to somalia i think you, you you've raised a very important point that is the tripart tripartite agreement uh, between kenya unhcr and the somali government um, However, the key component of the tripartite agreement is the voluntary return of these refugees. Between then and now, the number of refugees who've gone is not more than 2,000. And even though of, even of those ones, some have actually come back. So I mean, the key here is voluntary repatriation. If these guys feel that it is secure for them to go back into Somalia, then that is a choice that they can make. However, what we are realizing is that it's not so much the pull factor into Somalia, but the push factor inside Kenya that is making even some of those ones who are making, you know, the dangerous uh, trek from Dadaab to into, into Somalia. So, I mean, while that process is going on, the government has moved ahead and given an ultimatum saying that these refugees should go back or they can be forcefully moved back into Somalia. I mean, as we all know, South Central Somalia is not safe as we speak now. There, there are towns that have been liberated by Amazon forces, but during the day, those towns are safe for whatever reasons. But in the evening, Al-Shabaab calls the shot in those towns. So, I mean, it's, it's very unfair to say that these guys should go back. However, the other thing that we have to um, uh, remind ourselves is that over the past few years, because of the prevailing insecurity, specific groups have been collectively accused of contributing to insecurity. Initially, we had the Somali community, and uh, largely the Muslim communities, and now it's the refugees. And, you know, during Operation Salama Watch, uh, none of the refugees who are, who are found were, were, um, were tried under the Prevention of Terrorism Act. That tells you that we do not have sufficient evidence that this is happening. And secondly, the, the one, one issue that a lot of people don't talk about is the fact that if indeed we have, you know, terrorists infiltrating the refugee camp, it's because, it's simply because of the government's, uh, Kenyan government's policy. There are no proper screening of the refugees. The border was closed, so not most, most refugees haven't been registered. Mm -hmm. And also the question of enforced encampment in the camps of some of these refugees, some who have been staying in urban areas. So, I mean, it's a counterproductive move, and we are now adding a new layer to it. All right, counterproductive, as you mentioned, and I wish we had more time to discuss this very topic, but remember, you can be a part of it. Uh, should the Dab refugee camp be relocated to Somalia? Also, having in mind that majority leader uh, of 
Kenya, that is Adam Duale, did mention uh, that, you know, there's no harm in relocating the refugees 30 kilometers into Somalia because no matter what, if something goes wrong, you know, Kenya can still help these refugees even when they're just 30 kilometers into Somalia. But of course, a lot of critics have argued that this is all in a bid to secure Kenya but at what cost are we securing Kenya when we know that Kenya plays host to one of the largest refugee camps in the world? Now, let's cross now to a more important issue here, and it's actually a crisis across the African continent. After the worst shipwreck off the coast of Italy that may have killed hundreds of migrants, the International Organization for Migrants says that there may be three more migrant boats in distress in international waters. Authorities still don't know the fate of many of the passengers, including children who were on the large ship bound from Libya to Europe that capsized, uh, that was last week in the frigid waters of the Mediterranean Sea. Now that sinking may be the worst in a series of disasters in which migrants have lost their lives on vessels that are too rickety to survive uh, long voyages. Many of the migrants who board ships to cross the Mediterranean come from sub-Saharan Africa, and that is Kenya, Uganda, Ethiopia, you know, Somalia, and all those countries, often traveling for weeks or months just to get to the ships. And they're seeking a better life. But the ruthless smugglers who organize the voyages exploit many of them, and traffickers are believed to charge anywhere from $6,450,000 uh, to well, $6,450 rather, to about $8,600 per person for the dangerous voyage. Now, migrants seeking a better life in Europe have died by the thousands in the Mediterranean Sea in recent years while fleeing poverty and bloodshed in Africa, the Middle East and Asia. But the precise number of deaths is unknown. Authorities count only those bodies found in the sea, on shore, or aboard boats, and survivors often tell of fellow passengers who lost their lives at sea, but the bodies are never found. The International Business Times reports that as many as 1,500 migrants are believed to have died trying to cross the Mediterranean Sea uh, so far this year, and many were children. International Organization for Migration says the death toll in 2015 is on course to far exceed the 3,200 people who died making the journey in 2014. Fewer than 100 of the deaths in 2014 took place before May. Now, 23,500 have landed in Italy and more than 12,000 in Greece, according to the United Nations High Commission on Human Rights. And while those numbers sound high, they were even higher the previous year. In 2014, approximately 219,000 refugees and migrants sailed across the Mediterranean, with most having to be rescued by Italian Navy. So I'll just um, shoot this back to Abdullah Hiboro, who is also a researcher at Amnesty. Um, you know, this probably is the worst um, capsizing at the Mediterranean Sea. What do you make out of it? Uh, should Africans continue to make these trips knowing all so well that their lives are in danger? I think that's a very good question. You know, I mean, like, during the 18th, 19th century, we were talking about slave trade where people were forcefully, you know, taken from Africa to cross into, you know, via Atlantic into Europe and also in the, into the United States of America eventually. You know, but this one is fairly voluntary. I mean, a lot of the time the discussions around, you know, uh, this deadly voyage has been, um, has always centered around the pull factor of moving into Europe, right? But, uh, but we need to have serious discussions around the push factor in some of these African countries. For instance, folks in Libya, you know, uh, after NATO's invasion, you know, and the subsequent collapse of the Libyan government, we've have, we have seen so many people moving into, uh, you know, these kinds of business and moving into Europe. But I think the key issue here is we need to have in place you know, situations where people do not feel extremely desperate that their only way of survival is moving, you know, or engaging, you know, paying people who are um, unscrupulous traders who, you know, do not observe any safety requirements in some of those rickety boats, um, and as well as, you know, uh, diseases, some of them being thrown uh, um, into the sea. I think as, as Africans also, while it's very, uh, very important to you know, call out some of the European countries for their incredibly 
difficult immigration policies, African countries also need to ask ourselves the hard questions. Why are people leaving? In countries like Eritrea, you know, a massive number of people, I think probably largest after uh, Syrian refugees, uh, are moving into Europe because the situation in the country is incredibly difficult. So I think as Africans, we need to ask the hard questions and probably put enough pressure on our government to make situation bearable rather than making it incredibly difficult that people would have to choose between living in, in, in some of those uh, uh, countries uh, versus going into, you know, or going via this deadly voyage, which is incredibly difficult. At the, the amount of money that is uh, forked out of these migrants, six thousand five hundred or six thousand four hundred fifty dollars per person to make this trip, can't they use this amount of money, say, back home to develop themselves? As we wind up, yeah, I mean, you, you're right. I mean, that's a lot of money, you know. But people make that choice, you know. Um, I don't think anybody, you know, who is fairly comfortable will make that kind of decision. Of course, on the margins, there are people who feel like, oh no, maybe, you know, uh, I'll better the, my life and my and the lives of my family, my children and close uh, relatives. But I think the key here for me is that the situations in most of the African countries, despite the fact that, you know, we, we there is this buzz around Africa rising, you know, majority of these African countries have um, have met their targets as far as Millennium Development Goals are concerned. I think the key issue here is that you know the situ uh, Millennium Development Goals uh, are not an answer in and of themselves. You know, Africa rising buzz where it's only the you know a small percentage of people who are benefiting from it. Right. I think we we need to expand what you know Africa rising means for majority of people who are making this uh, expedition. Uh, what does the fulfillment uh, of MDG goals means for a lot of people? Because as it is, you know, there are only a small percentage of population that are benefiting, while a broad base at the bottom is not really reaping the reward of uh, what is, you know, uh, 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 the economic growth in most of the African countries. Right, economic growth as you mentioned. Well, thank you so much, Abdullahi Boru. It was such an honor having you here on Africa Speaks to give us insights on what exactly is happening around the continent, the relocation of the Dab, and also uh, the continued deaths of migrants who are trying to leave Africa for a better life uh, in Europe. Thank you so much, Abdullahi. Thank you so much, my pleasure. And well, uh, Abdullahi's views there bring us to the end of Africa Speaks today. Not much time for the show, but hoping next week we can uh, host the UNHCR representative here in Kenya to decipher more on the Dadaab relocation. My name is Joy Durin Bira. Thank you for watching. <laughs>